in Sydney's dam. Let's go and have a look at a yellow-throated petronia. Look at that, everybody. This is the best sighting of a yellow-throated petronia that I think I've ever had. And mainly because... I know, I don't think it's going to do that. There though. is actually... Kind of yellow just looking throat, at its navel. You can see on that one there sp specifically because they don't often have the yellow throat. Sometimes it is completely invisible. It used to be known as the yellow throated sparrow. Isn't that nice? And you can see why it was known as a sparrow. It's part of the sparrow family. It looks like a sparrow. The most obvious feature of it is that very white eye stripe and not the yellow throat. The yellow throat actually isn't. The brilliant. Jean-Dre, are you overwhelmed with excitement? Can you barely contain yourself? I know it's very difficult, but you're doing very well at holding it together as we behold the magnificence of the yellow-throated Petronia. Why are you zooming out of the yellow-throated Petronia? To provide special reflectors. I see. Very good. I'm just worried we might lose the yellow-throated Petronia. And here's an interesting one that you can use it as an identifier from if you just happen to see it. It walks, it does not hop like the other sparrows do. Isn't that nice? I find that quite interesting. Now, if only we can get that one to move a bit, we'll be able to see if it walks or hops. Go on. Move. There we are. Walk. That's it. Walkies. Walkies. Heel. Walkies. Good. Walkies. Walkies. Come on. There we are. Don't run, just walk. But you can see it is not a hopper like a sparrow is. That's fascinating. I mean, I must confess, I don't think you could confuse the yellow-throated Petronia for anything else once you've had a view of it like this. But look at them, they're both waddling about the place. They really are not hoppers at all. I think that's amazing. And also, you may hear that the excitement in my voice is slightly elevated by the fact that the light is finally starting to soften as the sun heads towards the west. We're just about at three in a row pan, so let's go up here and have a look. Perhaps some more interesting birds on the way. Chandre, are you terribly impressed that I spotted the yellow-throated Petronia? Yes, you may have heard his response there, everybody. It went as follows. Uh, Sounds like a slightly nauseous goat. Quite amazing, there's not a thing drinking at this pan. Oh, come on now, there must be something here. Maybe quarantine is here. There's a slender mongoose, Chandri. Just on the edge there, can you see it? Well spotted. Look at that, going down into his hole. Well, let's just wait here and see if he doesn't emerge. Bearing a snake, perhaps. A Mozambican spitting cobra. A junior black mamba. A little African rock python, maybe. Alternatively, he might just be going in there to have a chill session. Right, possibly the latter. <laughs> I was just trying to buy some time, hoping something would arrive at the water while we were doing that. <laughs> I'm absolutely gobsmacked. 
but there isn't an elephant here. <laughs> Hello, Brian. You say your dog now wants to go walkies. Will I take him? Uh, it, Brian, it very much depends on what kind of dog he is. So if you let me know, I will then let you know if I'm prepared to take him for a walk or not. A drinking dove. Well, that's not quite an elephant genre, but it will have to do. What genre I meant to say was a dove thinking about drinking. Now in two minds. Brian, I'm just also not sure that walking your dog around where I currently live is a particularly good idea, but you know, if you sign an indemnity for the fellow, I'll take him for a walk. As long as he's not a Pekingese or something like that. <laughs> as long as he's not a dog that is cunning, or a rat cunningly disguised as a dog. I'm not a fan of the rat-like canine. That is the mud that was on my shoe. You may have noticed that I'm still trying to buy time, Jandre, hoping something will come here and have something to drink. You know, I wasn't very good with clay at school, Jandre. I once made a beer glass for my father out of clay. Uh, unfortunately, it didn't hold liquid, so it wasn't very effective. The very kind art teacher's report said at the end of term, his work lacks finish, which I thought was rather kind, given that I didn't think it had a beginning, let alone a finish. I thought I may have seen something on the termite mound there, but I didn't. No, nothing. Okay, what we're going to do from here is we're going to head down onto the southern boundary of Cheetah Plains and we're going to head all the way then across to the western side and see if we can't see something along there. While we do that, Jamie is in the middle of a dressage test. Our dressage is still continuing. I'm actually going to... I'm going to reposition. I know we've got the zebra here, but this one poor zebra is doing something so interesting. Minding its own business, and then something very clearly bit it. Now what often happens is they get um, larvae of a certain type of insect, blowfly larvae, that get laid in their nostrils, which is why you often see them going, phew, phew. But whatever happened to this poor, okay, no, he's really not, he's not having it. <laughs> he's just still galloping off down the road. And I don't want to separate it any further from the rest of its group. That's very cool. Anyway, something clearly bit this poor zebra in the ear, and it started bucking and kicking and then dashing past us. Terribly disgruntled. Shame. So back to our conversation about ectoparasites. Awesome view. A zebra silhouette disappearing off along the road. It looks like it's walking in one spot. It doesn't seem to get any further away. Oh, that's cool. hand off the road. Shame, poor zebra. Okay, let's see if I can't get a view of the rest of its herd now that it's disappeared. Most of them are on Buffle's hook. We might be able to go and catch up with that zebra if we can't get a view of these guys. This is where Vula disappeared to first thing this morning. We just, just missed out on seeing him. How's that, Brian? Are you okay there? Perfect. We 
Lydia, standing in the typical zebra pose. Oh, my goodness, lady, on the right. <laughs> out towards us and behind each other. So essentially watching each other's back and at the same time using their tails to swish away the flies from the face of the other zebra. So it's the perfect pose for them. And those of you who are very keen-eyed might have spotted some impala moving around at the back as well. Also provides a nice comfortable chin rest and the odd chin scratch if you're feeling that way inclined. Very common to see mothers and foals standing in this way. You might find that the zebra on the left is the adult offspring of the female on the right. She looks so uncomfortable. And one thing that we have been, I say we, James has been very fortunate enough to witness was a live zebra birth. And there you go, Tasha. You were wondering about whether I've ever seen a zebra giving birth and what sign they give. So, Tasha, when was it, Brian? It was with Dave. And it was, it must have been about three, four. Well, there we go. It was on the 4th of March. It was the day after my birthday. So, Zebra and I nearly shared a birthday. Um, on the 4th of March, James got to see a zebra zebra mare giving birth to a foal. It all unfolded live and it was absolutely incredible. So in terms of what sign they give, those of you who are familiar with horses will know that they start to get a little bit uncomfortable, a little bit, ans a little bit antsy, often standing up, lying down, standing up, lying down, standing up, lying down, those sorts of levels of discomfort. And then of course, as soon as the water breaks, then you will know exactly what is going on. I've never seen a zebra give birth, I've seen a wildebeest give birth, and I've seen a couple of antelope species, but never, well, I say a couple, I've seen impala give birth, but I have never ever seen a zebra give birth. I can only imagine that they're very, very similar to horses, and those of you with horses, or familiar with horses, will know exactly how that process unfolds. Beautiful. That would definitely be something that I would absolutely love to witness. What have you seen give birth, Brian? Wildebeest. Wildebeest. Uh, we've got to, as soon as spring starts to arrive, we are of course in spring, we have a very, very good chance of a couple of live impala births. Well, hopefully we've got a chance of live impala birth. Generally, the one thing I will say that was interesting about James's, not the one thing, obviously there were lots of interesting things about Zebra, James's zebra birth. The one thing that was very interesting was the fact that she gave birth at night, or going into the evening. And typically you'll find that the antelope and the general game species will give birth a first thing in the morning, rather than late at night, because then it, it means that essentially their little ones have got a few crucial hours to get their legs under control, to stand up, to be less wobbly, to be able to run before the time of day when the predators become their most active. So it's more common for an animal to give birth in the morning rather than the evening. But whether or not that is the case with zebra, it wasn't the case with James's live zebra birth. There's a couple of things I really want to see. A live elephant birth is really high up there on my list of things I would love to see. Must be absolutely extraordinary. Bye bye, Zebbies. And I'm with you, Shamsun. I agree completely. We should spend a little bit, Shamsun says we should spend a bit more time with zebra and increase the chance of seeing a live zebra birth. Sorry, excuse me. I don't think that's a bad idea at all. And with a pregnant, we, as soon as we, if we were to see any kind of sign of discomfort from the female, we probably would. 
I haven't managed to have a really good zebra sighting recently. They've all been a little bit too far away. Those ones are on Buffel's hooks, so we can't go any closer to them. But it is always incredibly enjoyable spending time. We've been spoiled recently with the big cat sightings, but of course it's not just about the big cats. And spending time with all of the animals can lead to some truly fascinating sightings and behavior that you wouldn't necessarily have expected. I'm on the lookout for elephants. I would like a nice elephant sighting for my afternoon. And hello to Velma. I'm so sorry I just missed out on your visit. Mm. I was on holiday, but I did hear wonderful things about it. Now, Velma, you wanted to know, would, with the lack of grass, would it affect the foal's health? Yes, probably. Um, especially for zebra, they are bulk grazers. They don't really feed on much else. Oh, much else. So they're going to be ones that really start to struggle the, the longer and longer the rains take. So yes, I think it's going to be very hard on mom. It's going to be very hard on the foal. She's going to somehow have to sustain herself and manage to produce enough re or provide the resources for lactation. I don't know how she's going to manage that. So yes, it will be hard for mom and hard for the foal. It will definitely have an impact on the foal's health and the foal's growth. While I make my way to whatever remains of Buffel's Hook Dam on the subject of our drought, let's go back across to James and find out how his explorations of the Great Plains of the Cheetah is going. We have emerged from the Great Plains, everybody, and we are coming towards what is known, ironically, as Juma Dam, where I first and last saw the Styx cubbies. Now, I believe the two Styx... Um, Lionesses have been found quite close to Annette's, which is the border on which this dam lies. And so we might be very lucky to find them at the dam here. I have got a nasty feeling. <laughs> I just see another car there that I wasn't expecting to see. Oh dear. And my phone is not locating me at the moment. I think we're okay here. I'm pretty sure that's Cheetah Plains Lodge up there. Come on now, find me. Mmm, this is... Mm, um... Oh good, oh, just okay, Kirsten's got a GPS going. I'm not on Cheetah Plains. I'm absolutely not on Cheetah Plains. This is where we are, everybody, look. That's the border over there. We want to be at the dam there. We've come across the way. We shouldn't be here, we need to go back that way. If I go forward and turn right, no, that's not going to work either. Yes, now, a very salient point made by Kirsten. RJ, you were asking if we get lost. Um, yes, we do sometimes get lost, RJ. Here's the cut line. That is the cut line. <laughs> okay. I suppose, well, it's all very well that I take you into my confidence as I did the podcast, which means um, it's possibly a little bit too public.
We're okay now. <laughs> Me? No, no, I've just come from... Yeah, no, no. I'm just pra practicing what I'm going to say when uh, I come across someone from Chitwa Chitwa. <laughs> ah, a comment from Graham Wallington saying, Hello James, I am watching. We're okay now. <laughs> this is the perfect time for those crickets, Chandra, don't you think? <laughs> yes, yes, indeed. indeed. <laughs> of all the times that could have happened to me, I choose the day that his eminence, Graham Wallington, has chosen to watch the internet show. Right. Try and let the adrenaline flush, coursing through my body, dissipate. I can't bring myself to even look at the lens anymore, you see, because I'll be looking my boss in the eye. And thank you, Mind Warp. Uh, yes, I did. You say, um, didn't I say how hard it was to get lost? I don't know that I said it was very hard to get lost. I, <laughs> I may have said it's impossible to get lost. Yes, yes. I wasn't lost so much as just off piste. <laughs> it was, I mean, I was And Kirsten seemed to think I was perfectly issues up. I can't be blamed. Chandra, you shut up or I'll put you in a zizzy bush. <laughs> Dreadfully awkward. Dreadfully awkward. Okay, here we go. We're okay now. Let's just forget it happened. Okay, John, we'll, we'll just forget. Okay, thanks. Forget what? Could everybody please, exactly. Forget what? Yes, Graham says I'm glad, he's glad I wasn't on Marla Marla or Londa Lozi. I too am glad I wasn't on Marla Marla or Londa Lozi. Uh, certainly the latter would have meant that I'd crossed three or four properties by mistake without noticing. And that, ladies and gentlemen, MJ especially, would uh, mean that I had seriously lost my mind. <laughs> right, let me find something biological to show you, which might be of slightly more interest than my disappearing off piste. Perhaps this very large termite mound will give us something interesting to look at. Oh, Carol in New York, you say, or Karen in New York, you say, what penalty could there be for uh, going onto or being caught on another reserve? Uh, normally, it's um, normally it's a firing squad at dawn. Uh, Carol, as luckily we avoided that, but I did see another car coming towards us, and um, you know, had I been caught, you know, if they'd been particularly lenient, perhaps 50 lashes, uh, but if not, then possibly a firing squad. No, they would have been, I mean, nine times out of, in fact, almost 99 times out of 100, if somebody's made a mistake like that, they really won't react at all. They will just say, ah, you seem to be slightly off piste, chum, would you like to go back? At which point you say, oh, I'm so sorry. Now, here's a very large community nest spider's web. Now, what I want to see, I know you've seen many of these, everyone, or most of you have. They have some new viewers. Dana, you're one of them. I'm just going to take a piece of it out. Now, I know to many of you who are perhaps arachnophobic, uh, if, if you are an arachnophobe, just imagine doing what I'm going to do now. Oh. Oh. 
I'm just going to take a little piece of it out because I don't think there's any, there's too much activity here. And I'm going to bring it to you. Yeah, this one looks like it's fairly unoccupied. <laughs> I've never thought of that actually. I mean, the thought of doing that for somebody who's arachnophobic would be utterly horrific. And there you can see how amazingly fine it is. Yes? Hold it up closer to the lens. Ah, there we are. Nice. Now, there are no spiders in it, and the little female spiders that make the web, I think, are quite possibly either in the middle of it, or they go dormant for the winter, or even die during the winter time. And then their eggs, the little spiderlings, which I always think is quite a nice name for something that gives such terror to so many people, the little spiderlings will hatch and continue the next generation as the summer comes because what they are dependent on of course is insects falling or flying into it they don't go out and hunt themselves and it's not exactly uh, well it's like an orb web basically it catches flying insects and if there aren't any flying insects well you know times get a little bit lean as they might for me I'm fined for going off piste Don't you think that Graham should have to warn us if he's watching from the beginning? I think he should. I think he should have to say, I am watching today, please behave. I'm not sure I would have done half the things I did today if I'd known he'd been watching. Right, as Kirsten says, <laughs> I should now link across to Jamie Patterson, who always behaves. <laughs> Well, I mean, I would hate to disappoint at this point. Well, we've arrived at Buffelshook Dam, or what's left of Buffelshook Dam. It's not even Buffelshook Mud anymore. And there's absolutely nothing here. No water, no mud, just dried cracks in the earth. It's quite scary. I don't think I've been back to Buffelshook Dam in quite a considerable period of time. I had heard it was dry. It is very dry. Right, well, in that case, we'll carry on. Since all is silent. Now, not much has changed since I last saw you. The zebra moved further, well, we moved off away from the zebra. They looked like they were going to go further into Buffles Hook. And it seems as though all of the animals are hiding from the afternoon heat in whatever shade they can find. Mm -hmm. Playing hard to get this afternoon. I'm slowly making my way back in the direction of those Birmingham boys. As it starts to get a little bit cooler, hopefully they will decide to get up and moving. And perhaps even give us a little bit of an indication as to where the Inkahumas are hiding. We know they're here. They are somewhere on this property. It's just a matter of working out exactly where it is they've gone. Their tracks are all over the show. I know that Rexon's been working very, very hard this afternoon to try and track them down. Unfortunately, he hasn't had any success and neither have we. And a very warm welcome, as always, to Annie in British Columbia. It's lovely to have you on board. And you asked a very good question, because we've spoken a lot about the fact that this drought situation is going to have a tremendously negative effect on the prey species, um, but not so much on the predators. In fact, for the predators, it's going to be a time of plenty. But obviously, that comes with a limit. And you want to know, well, how long will it be until the deteriorating health and numbers of the prey species impacts the predators a long time so the, the sort of the number of prey species if you could plot a graph kind of will go like this and the predators will also do that but much much later on so a couple of years down the line so for them they're just going to keep as animals start to die of either dehydration or most likely starvation 
the animal, the predators are going to keep scavenging and they're going to continue to scavenge and scavenge until there's nothing left for them to scavenge and it, again also for hunting as well it's so much easier for them because the prey has to go to certain water holes and I would suggest that it's only towards when we start seeing proper rain again and an abundance of greenery that the predators will actually start to have a little bit of an impact in terms of their hunting ability because then the prey will be more widely distributed and it will be harder for them to find food and so you'll only get that knock-on effect probably years later in terms of the impact that it has on the predators that being said it depends upon other things as well there's other factors to consider as well that's that's a basic idea but diseases are also going to start to play a role so the more unhealthy the animals the worse the condition that they're in the easier the disease diseases will spread and we could well get outbreaks of things like anthrax we could also get outbreaks of rabies distemper other diseases like that that flourish when there is a dip in the health of the general animal population so that is something to look out for as well over the next few months not to be too depressing and morbid about it all the predators I think though are going to generally have a field day and we're just talking about it and saying that if it continues like this we're going to have the some enormous predators wandering about they're going to be positively round all the time and I noticed that when we went to the Kruger National Park in March which it's the driest I've ever seen the Kruger I can only imagine what it looks like now presumably much like this and we walk we drove past we didn't walk sorry we drove past probably two dead elephants and about maybe five or six dead buffalo and everywhere every time we saw a hyena it had a belly out here like um, whenever we see our hyena clan when they've been feeding with those enormous almost beach like they've swallowed beach balls they were all looking incredibly fat and healthy and it's one of the things that will be good for our current set of baby predators we've got lion cubs everywhere that's going to be it's a time of plenty for them it's a good time for them to have been born our leopards as well and most definitely our hyenas if they ever decide to return to us which at some point I'm really hoping they might do there has been an increase, speaking of hyenas, there has been an increase in hyena activity. I don't know if that means they're going to come back to us with their den site. They have been, they have definitely been denning in the Manuleti or around the Manuleti. They might be slowly moving back further to the south or they might just be patrolling their territory as they would normally do. I was hoping for some elephants this afternoon but they have evaded me. On the other hand, James Henry has been much more fortunate and has managed to find some. Indeed we have everybody much more successful, well, very sort of on our last sort of approach here at Cheetah Plains. Beautiful elephant sighting going on right next to the car. And she's just feeding on the last bits of Combretum calinum, or the variable bush willow. And you can see beautifully there how she's taken off those little bits of bark. And as Jandre was saying to me, surely there's a—I mean, there's lots of bark still available. But then, as he correctly answered his own question, he said, "Yes, but obviously it's only one part of their diet. You know, they need such a wide and varied diet." that you know they need to uh, there are lots of different things they want to eat and so i think that they were for example heading off east into the kruger yesterday and i'm sure that there are patches there that they know they need to go to to get certain kinds of plants shandri before you go in on her can i ask you to just slip to the left a little bit onto where the little one's been eating and you can see the little one not quite strong enough yet to break the branch off but just left it in situ and kind of chewed the bark off while it was there. Now, that little elephant is probably about 20 meters from it. Us, his mother, about 8 meters from us. 8 meters, oh, that's a nice shot. 8 meters, about 24 or 25 feet or so. 5.9 meters on the focus mark. <laughs> Thank you, Jean-Dre. You may be quiet now. 
Now, we're not going to follow her because coming from the other side is a large cow there. Well, there was the sun. I'm not a large cow. I'm a large idiot. But uh, <laughs> there is the large cow there. And I think you'll find that that big cow is the matriarch. She's noticeably bigger than the others and therefore probably older. And I think she will be instructing this crew on where to go. You can see she's got a ripped ear, speaking of years of experience living here. And you know what we haven't spoken about, everyone? We haven't spoken about the Great Elephant Census that has just been completed. I'm just going to back up a little bit. Great Elephant Census took into account basically all of the habitat in Africa where elephants now live. And it showed up some fairly startling results. And I've yet to wade through the entire thing. But some of the depressing things um, were that in only three countries, Botswana, South Africa, and I think the other was Zimbabwe, strangely enough, have elephants managed to maintain or increase their population. South Africa, they've gone up. Botswana, they've absolutely gone up. Zimbabwe, they've m maintained, sort of. Kenya, Tanzania, all of those other iconic parts of Africa where elephants exist, Zambia, Uganda, they've all lost many, many elephants over the last 10 years or so. And in Tanzania, 60% loss. So we don't really know why that is. Let's have a look at these ones. But here in South Africa, they are much safer and they seem to be thriving here in the Kruger Park. Despite the fact that there is a drought going, they're all doing okay. And you can see the light has just changed completely from when we started this drive. That burnt out white colour has been turned to a gorgeous orange. And as we know, Jandre, the combination of gold and grey is just very lovely indeed. <laughs> Still, unfortunately, scarred by the thought that um, our boss watched me go off piste there. Hello, Justin. Just listen carefully. There was a lovely sound there of the elephant speaking. And if you say, if I could be the first human being to understand what elephants say, what would I want to say to them? Uh, what would I want to ask them? Um, you know what I would do? As with any kind of uh, culture that has an oral tradition as opposed to a written tradition, I'd love to ask the oldest ones here what it was like when they were young and what the, what the changes have been like and how things have changed. And then I would also ask them, that would probably be the second thing I asked them, Justin, the first thing I'd ask them is, what do you think of people? What do you, when you see us, what do you think? Do you think terror, fear, predators? Do you think, what a bunch of idiots? Uh, do you think... Oh, I would just be fascinated to know what on earth those wizened eyes uh, consider when they look at us. And just a breeze blowing out of the northwest again. Strange, I think, strange wind. And the reason the light has been diffused so beautifully now is that there's a lot of smoke and dust in the western horizon from felt fires or forest fires and dust blown up by the wind. Totally normal for this time of year. They just look like they've got stories to tell, don't you think, Justin? I suppose it's got something to do with the wrinkliness of their skin that makes them look like they've got something wise and interesting to tell us. Even the young ones like that. That's probably a oh, roughly a ten-year-old cow. In fact, probably a ten-year-old bull. Difficult to tell before they hit puberty. But you can see the little tusks pointing outwards, which is sometimes indicative of a little bull. And now he's standing in the middle of a strychnos thicket in black monkey orange um, thicket. Hmm. 
we'll just try for one more look. I'm just going to get a little bit closer here. Now I was saying that I thought the elephants were looking pretty ropey. Some have certainly looked a bit ropey, but these guys look fine. Their hips are not sticking out. That is, that cow over there is absolutely enormous. The big matriarch. Let's see if we can get a look at her. I don't want to be complacent about getting too close to them because we are very close now. So I'm just going to ease through here. I doesn't want to block them off or make them feel threatened. I just want you to have a look at this very large animal. I'm just going to stop there. She's huge. I think she stands about nine feet at the shoulder. That is very big for a cow. Oh, no, that's a substantial, substantial cow. I don't know how many of you have watched um, the Game of Thrones, uh, but that is the Brian of Tarth, if you like, of the elephant world. <laughs> Andre didn't get my joke because he hasn't washed it. <laughs> anyway, she's a fairly formidable woman in the Game of Thrones. And then just to the left of us, right close by here, some little elephants. I'm going to take a picture of one, Andre. Can you see me? I can't. No, you can't see my picture. Don't be silly. Hmm. It's a classic. Much Strychnos madagascarensis in it. <laughs> you see the sticky outy tusks there I was talking about? <laughs> Hello RJ, an interesting one you say. Very strange that they call them cows and bulls even though they look nothing like an actual cow. Remember, um, the animal, when I say cow, you're obviously thinking of your uh, garden variety Friesland that produces the milk you have with your cereal in the mornings. Um, it's actually, I mean, the term for those animals are cattle. And we refer to male cattle as cows, and male, at least, no, we don't. We refer to male cattle as bulls and female cattle as bulls in the same way that we refer to male buffalo as bulls and female buffalo as cows. And so it's not actually, cow and bull is not a designation of cattle. It's a designation of, of a number of different animals, including whales, for example. We'd call a bull whale and a cow whale. Not sure the same applies to dolphins. Does it the same apply to dolphins, Jondre? No. Not so much. He does that. I don't know what that means, but I think it means no. <laughs> Yeah. I think it has got to do with the size, yeah. So, the smallest animal out here that's known as a bull is a nyala, and you can call a nyala female a ewe or a cow, but anything smaller than that is a ewe and a ram, and then a lamb for the youngster. And if you've got a bull and a cow, male and female, then the youngster is a calf. And that's the same for whales. And here we go, we've just had an answer from Kirsten McClellan Smithereen saying that a dolphin is in fact a bull and a cow and a calf. So, just to be clear again, RJ, cattle, the designation cow and bull is just what we've come to know them as, but it's actually just a way of saying male and female. Shall we have another look at this rather confiding young bull here? Son of Brian. Which will not be funny to you unless you've seen the show. <laughs> He's very sweet, isn't he? I might have to take another picture of him, John Dre. That was a hopeless one. It's blurred. All right, well, as they disappear off there, we'll turn around and head back towards Juma. Let's go across to Pajamas Patterson and find out where in the world she is behaving herself. Our things have changed dramatically while you were with James and the elephants because 
Brian and myself stumbled upon a very, very fresh set of tracks belonging to the Inkahumas. Little cubs up and down clearly. And what's amazing about this particular set of tracks is that they're on top of the vehicle tracks from this morning. Now, I don't think anybody's driven along that particular road this afternoon, so they're not that fresh, but they are from some point after some of the safari vehicles drove along that particular road this morning. And that's really good news because what it means is that the lionesses, there's a good chance that the lionesses went to fetch the cubs and bring them in this direction. It could be for a kill, or it could be for they just decided that that's time for them to move away from that den site at Gauri Cut Line. So Rexon, I've called him in, he's coming to help us. We're going to go and check Batelier Road. The difficulty is the tracks are crisscrossing up and down over each other, under each other. The cubs, you've seen the way that cubs move with the adults. They don't really pick one direction. They run forward and then they run back and then they go and pounce on one of their buddies, one of their cousins or a sibling, and then they carry on. But we're going to be keeping our eyes seriously peeled for these lions because they're somewhere here. Those tracks were beautifully fresh. Let's just check around here. Okay. Now we're taking a gamble because we're running out of light. Although luckily we've got the extended light of this sort of spring, lengthening spring days, which is good for us because it means that towards the end of the sunset safari we still have a little bit of light. As you know with the Inkahumas and their little babies, we can't put a spotlight on them. I have no doubt. They're between Batalia and Gwari Pan Road. I took a chance, I went south. They might also have gone north. Most of their tracks seem to be coming south though. And they could be somewhere they could be lying on the road for we know. We might have missed them completely. Now as we continue looking for the lions, little creatures are slowly starting towards their home. Little ones, I see you. Come on. Oh, there goes one. There's one there, Brian. Go forward a little bit. There we go. Little dwarf mongoose. Settling in for the evening. I'm just making generic sounds at them, really. <laughs> No rhyme or reason behind it. The There's almost a dwarf mongoose contact call. Definitely one of my favorite little predators to look for and to sit and watch. Isn't it beautiful? Well, this is the Sabi Sand smallest carnivore ferocious hunter of things like scorpions and other such insects with their long claws. This is a dwarf mongoose for our new viewers. It's one of our communal species of mongoose, in other words social groups, and they live together in families of usually roughly around 10 mongoose in these abandoned termite mounds and they're just about to go to bed for the evening. They're slowly starting to gather closer and closer to the entrances of their burrows before ducking down for the evening. And their days are getting longer too. In winter, the dwarf mongoose is quite a lazy little creature and only really emerges at around 8 o'clock or so in the morning. They have to wait until it's warmed up suitably before they decide to emerge and go out foraging. Now the summer is approaching. They can start heading out first thing and go hunting whatever poor unsuspecting arthropod or amphibian they happen to encounter, or even reptile. An interesting thing about them is that they are not particularly fastidious. They're more than happy to defecate around the entrance to their burrows, which means that it's very, very easy to identify which termite mounds are occupied by dwarf mongoose and they have a couple of different 
locations that they rotate between so that they don't have to worry about going too far away from one den site at night because they can just go to bed in, in the neighboring one. Fiercely territorial. And Shamsan, we like our new camera too, don't we, Brian? Yep. <laughs> Allowing us to get as close as it does to the dwarf mongoose, or indeed any of our animals. It just allows for, I don't know, it just makes everything more magical. You get to see more detail, the nuances of a particular sighting, the nuances of a particular animal. There they are grooming each other. That's awesome, reinforcing the bonds between each one. And as you know, dwarf mongoose have incredibly complex social structures. So this aloe grooming forms a very, very important part of their interaction with each other. They have an alpha male and an alpha female. You could well be looking at them, for all I know. You know I'd have to spend a little bit more time with this particular group before I could draw that conclusion. They've got an alpha male and an alpha female, and only they will breed. The rest of the family is dedicated to helping raise their offspring. Having a jolly good scratch before it's time to settle down. And they will all raise the offspring together. We've been treated to one incredible live sighting with the dwarf mongoose where the there was a massive snake. We think it was a cobra, but it, was, it wasn't there long enough for us to properly identify it. And then we watched them as they were alarm calling. The snake disappeared off and the dwarf mongoose then proceeded to move their little ones from one home to another. And what was absolutely incredible was just watching all of them race backwards and forwards with these dangling dwarf mongoose babies in their mouths. Shifting them around and keeping them safe. It was a truly magical experience and then constantly calling to each other. The very special moments of our live safaris. I'm so torn now. It's wonderful sitting with them, but these lions, we're running out of time. We've got 25 minutes, Brian, to find them. Oh dear. Oh dear, indeed. Luckily, we have Rex in helping us, otherwise. We might have really stacked the odds against ourselves, but I really, really want to check Nyala Road South before the end of the sunset safari. What to do? What to decide? Oh, look at you. Hey, look at that. That is awesome. See that white patch of fur on the dwarf mongoose's shoulder? So thanks to the live drives and in fact thanks to the cameras that allow us to get so close to the dwarf mongoose, we had an amazing sighting with one which that had white fur all over its face it looked like it was wearing a Halloween mask kind of looked like it was wearing face paint or something similar and I asked a friend of mine who spends her life researching dwarf mongoose and she told me that it is whenever they get an injury or a scar or something quite serious some serious damage to their skin then very often the fur grows back white around that particular area so on that little dwarf mongoose's left shoulder there you go, you'll be able to see it there, on that side of his neck. And that, that almost looks like a bite. So that was some kind of injury or skin problem. And as a result, his fur has grown back grey in that area. Immediately makes them completely identifiable, because apparently it stays that way. you found. Oh, found something exciting there. How cool is that? Oh, termites, yummy. Look at all of those. They've just come flying out. All of those, sorry, I don't know what happened to my voice there. I'm just going to take, I've put my foot on the brake again. I'm naughty. That's not Brian, it's me. Um, that is so cool. We often talk about whether or not dwarf mongoose eat termites. I mean, that 
Dwarfmongus was very clearly disrupting that log so as to pluck them out. And they're a very, very rich source of protein. Slapping them up. Look at him go. Sharp, needle-like teeth. Oh, one of them just bit it. <laughs> and they've all vanished now. They've all retreated under cover. Oh, no, there's one still there. And, of course, the soldiers will come out with their powerful mandibles to fend off the attacker. The dwarf mongoose is not at all bothered and still relentlessly grabbing at the termites. And Safari Ginny, sorry, you were asking about their babies and how many they have. The answer is between two and six. An average in this area of about four, but it's it can be anywhere in that range. And of course, as I said, the alpha female, what are you looking at? Spotted something. The alpha female is the only one that breeds. The rest of them will help her. Sometimes a beta female will breed. And very often those offspring are killed by the alpha female. It's, it's almost similar. It's definitely comparable, at least, to the wild dog. Also have an alpha male and female pair. I think you got them. Oh! <laughs> Somebody else would like to have a go there. Moved in to take its spot. Now the evening is filled with the sounds of their gentle squeaks as they contact call to each other. Yep, you missed out on the feast. You have to dig for your own. RJ, no, they don't only eat termites. They are accomplished scorpion killers, as well as things, even things like small snakes, lizards, um, even tiny baby chameleons. They are fierce little predators. And frogs as well. Amphibians will also be on their menu. As I said, the smallest of our carnivores. And those teeth, speaking from experience, are not to be trifled with. You see how quickly it swipes its paw in with those claws and then pulls back, avoiding the attentions of the soldier termites. This is so cool. I think this is probably the best view I've ever seen of a dwarf mongoose grabbing termites. It's incredible. Munch, 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 munch. They're also, being as tiny as they are, they might be a threat to the <coughs> different insects and various other creatures, but there's also lots and lots of things out here that feed off dwarf mongoose. Anything from birds of prey, to the smaller cat species, things like serval, African wildcat, and snakes as well. So they're constantly on alert and ready to go dashing back to the safety of their burrows. Absolutely magic. A bit more aloe grooming before heading off to bed. And things must be pretty tough for them at the moment. In fact, you'll probably find the termites are making up a bulk of their diet just because there's no insects around. There's no insects. The reptiles have generally gone to ground. They're estivating because of the dry. I think that probably termites are actually what a lot of them are, what they're feeding on a great deal of the time. 
and Mia in Illinois. I don't think I've ever heard of them scavenging off a big carcass, but... Oh, cool. Um, oh, no, sorry, it stopped. I was, one of them was anal pasting, but unfortunately it was just out of the view of the camera, and if I'd moved it would have scared it away, unfortunately. Mia, sorry, no, I don't think I've ever heard of them scavenging off carcasses. I wouldn't put it past them. Um, I, I imagine that, like all of our animals, they are not particularly choosy about their diet, so they may well do it. I've definitely heard of genets, which are a relative of mongoose. They're not in the same family, but they are more, they are relatively closely related. They're in the viviridae family. The mongoose are in the herpestidae family. And at one point, biologists lumped them all together. I've definitely heard of genets scavenging off carcasses, so I guess it's possible mongoose do too, but I've never seen it or heard of it. I guess perhaps they don't really want to put them in harm, themselves in harm's way, running the risk of going up to a carcass like that. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, this has been a magical sighting. I know that James is on his way back from Cheetah Plains, so he's experiencing some tricky signal issues. I'm desperate to just go and see if the lions are around the next corner. I just can't stop myself, so we'll have to... We'll leave our dwarf mongoose for now. They're going to go to bed anyway. They're on their way home. So I'm going to leave our dwarf mongoose. I'm going to go in search of these lions just for the last few moments of the sunset safari. Come on. We can definitely put it out of the bag in the last 15 minutes. It's happened before. Come on, lions. There's some very relaxed looking in Yala, which doesn't necessarily completely preclude the possibility of predators being around, but it does make it slightly more unlikely. I'll show them to you in one moment. James's top five beautiful antelope, or oh, top five beautiful creatures. Hello, Nyala. Have you by any chance seen some very large tawny cats? somewhere between here and Central Road. I bet you have. I bet you know exactly where they are. Nyalas are very good at keeping secrets. <laughs> you can see the beautiful contrast there between the male and the female. I'm sorry, Nyala, you are lovely. You are really lovely. But I can't. I need to know. I really need to know how these lions have been dodging us the whole day. Bye-bye. Let me know if you see anything. Thank you. I wonder if they're in here somewhere. By the sounds of things, Rexon agrees with my assessment that south is the direction to go. It sounded like he was on his way in this direction as well. Come on, lions. If they do have a kill in here, it gives us a really nice place to start our sunrise safari. And Tucker, who is four years old, you very, very clever thing, you. Yes, lions do get very, very hot with their thick fur coats. So they get hot, much, much hotter than we do, which is why lions sleep all day and only go around at night, especially in summer. So they can walk around in the day, but they get super hot super quickly, and then they feel really uncomfortable. 
So that's why lions move about at night time and we move about in the daytime. And their thick shaggy coat of course helps to camouflage them so they need it. It helps to keep them hidden away from the animals that they're hunting. But at the same time it definitely, and they can't sweat Tucker. So on a really hot day when you start to sweat or maybe you've been doing lots of exercise, lions can't do that. So they have to just pant and all of the blood around their tongues helps to cool them down. That's what I'm hoping to find. Some warm, panting lions. Doesn't look like they've crossed here. Just an update for those of you who are wondering why I was listening to the Game Drive channel, Tundi is on Torchwood. And speaking of creatures slowly making their way west, James has made his way back onto Juma. Let's find out what he's up to. Jamie just referred to me as a creature, everybody. I'm not sure, sure that I'm going to be able to look her straight in the eye after that. I suppose I am a creature of sorts, but really a compliment when you refer to a fellow human being as a creature. <laughs> anyway, uh, well, I do know where I am now, RJ, in case you're wondering. We are now at the uh, boundary of Cheetah Plains. Uh, that's uh, not Cheetah Plains, that's Cheetah Cut Line there. Uh, and Gauri, Maine. And we might be lucky and have Karula pop across in front of us. And there's a waterbuck and a nyala making friends. And an impala. Everyone is friends together. Now, I must just tell you while we look at that um, waterbuck that my face uh, feels very, um, well, basically like someone's put a blowtorch to it. And I think that's on a. I don't think I'm going to use Rebecca's uh, homemade. Um, sunscreen ever again in fact Whew. I feel like my features have been welded on anyway there's there's the <laughs> water buck and just up ahead over there Jean-Ri Impala yes there's the Impala I wanted to show that they were all friends together you see that peace and harmony reign in nature There we are, and slowly the day is setting. No Franklin's calling. There is the ubiquitous Drongo going. Otherwise, it really is very quiet indeed. Person doesn't think that my um, <laughs> doesn't think that my Forktail Drongo impression is very good. Thank you very much. Love to hear Kirsten make a Forktail Drongo noise. Pfft. It's really quite a lovely sound. Okay, carry on. Oh, that's easy to answer, Justin. You say, what's the most annoying animal call that is not a bird? Kirsten in the final control is the most annoying animal call that is not a bird. <laughs> um, the most annoying animal call in the world out here that is not a bird. What do you think it would be, other than a human being hitting a hammer against something? in the middle of the day. Um, Justin? Impala's quite nice. Nyala, don't, mosquito, there we go. Brilliant. Well done, Jean-Dre. That's exactly right, and I'm sure everyone will agree 
the sound of mosquito when you lie down in your bed and you can hear the calling of the owls outside and the gentle rustling of the wind in the branches and just as you're about to shut your eyes and go to sleep safe in the wilderness and you have that feeling that you don't want to move because maybe it's just one and it will lose interest and go away and as it fades off to the right hand side another one slightly different pitch comes and then the other one comes back and you get and they'll fly into you and try and bite you that is very, uh, that's very annoying indeed <laughs> what the mosquito song for the fireside chat thank you Timothy you agree with Jean-Dre and I the mosquito is by far the most <laughs> irritating animal sound out here it is I'm trying to think of uh, if there are any mammals that I would consider uh, irritating sounds I suppose there are quite a few insects that make sounds that some people might find irritating. For example, the cicada. The cicada in the distance is a very pleasant sound. The cicada calling next to your ear is like, well, like somebody drilling into your skull. What have you seen, Jean-Dre? Really? Two elephants? I think I see the one you see, Jean-Dre. It's difficult to see, though, because my face is swelling as a result of the... Uh, sunscreen I put on. Sorry, this is going to be almost impossible for you to level, isn't it? There we are. I leveled for you. I'm so kind. There we have our last elephant sighting of the day. You can see it's still light. We don't need to use any spotlights or anything like that. That will change at some stage, I think around about the halfway through the month. We'll probably shift the drive out a bit. You can see the piece of tree there that has been eaten. <laughs> Jen B, you say, you say it's not the sunscreen burning my face, but the burning shame of getting lost. Probably correct, Jen B. Thank you, Jean Dre, for your efforts today. We're going to hand you over to Jamie for the last part of the drive, everyone. And we'll see you tomorrow, hopefully, in a known location at 0600. Thank you for joining us on our drive to Cheetah Plains. We will see you tomorrow morning. Bye bye. I would laugh at James, but I've definitely made a very similar mistake before, so I am definitely not going to. I understand his dilemma completely. Uh, we might not have found our, elef uh, our lions for the last few moments of the sunset safari, but I have at least managed to find some elephants. And it's a lovely, peaceful way to finish off our sunset safari. I've just chatted to Rex and he said it is getting a little bit dark. Um, in, not to put too fine a point on it, a little bit too dark to go walking for lions with cubs <laughs> in thick vegetation, which is entirely fair. So we've abandoned the search for now. We will continue again on the sunrise safari, hopefully with a little bit more success.